Hey, it's Miss Dweck coming at you from quarantine. Um, I am about to continue my reading of book 12 of the Odyssey. Um, so if you watched the last video, I left off at page, at line 218. Um, and now I'm going to be reading from line 218 until the very end. So grab your book, grab your pen, grab your hero tracker if you want, because we are going to start reading. Um, if you recall from the last part, Odysseus just got some instructions on where, which way he should go and two monsters that he might possibly face. We have Scylla and we have Charbaris. Um, we survived the sirens. I hope you liked the song that I made up on the spot for you. Hey! Um, so now we're going to continue. So we are at line 218. We'd scarcely put that island astern when suddenly I saw smoke and heavy breakers, heard their booming thunder. The men were terrified, oar blades flew from their grip, grip, clattering down to splash in the vessel's wash. She lay there, dead in the water, no hands to tug the blades that drove her on. That she is the ship, just letting you know. So the men are so scared that the ship is not moving. But I strode down the decks to rouse my crewmen, halting beside each one with a bracing, winning word. Friends, we are hardly strangers at meeting danger, and this danger is no worse than what we faced when Cyclops penned us up in his vaulted cave with crushing force. But even from there, my courage, my presence of mind, and tactics saved us all. And we will live to remember this some day, I have no doubt. Up now, follow my orders. All of us work as one. You men, at the thwarts, lay on with your oars and pull and strike the heaving swells, trusting that Zeus will pull us through these straits alive. You! Helmsman, here's your order, burn it in your mind. The steering oar of our rolling ship is in your hands. Keep her clear of that smoke and surging breakers. Head for the crags or she'll catch you off guard. She'll yaw over there. You'll plunge us all in ruin. So I shouted. They snapped to each command. No mention of Scylla, how to fight that nightmare, for fear the men would panic desert their oars, and huddle down and stow themselves away. But now I cleared my mind of Cersei's orders, cramping my style, <laughs> cramping my style, urging me not to arm at all. I donned my heroic armor, seized long spears in both my hands, and marched out on the half-deck forward, hoping from there to catch the first glimpse of Scylla, ghoul of the cliffs, swooping towards swooping to kill my men. But nowhere could I make her out, and my eyes ached, scanning that mist-bound rock face, top to bottom. Now, wailing in fear, we rode up on these straits, Scylla to starboard, dreaded Charboris off to port, her horrible whirlpool gulping the sea surge down, down, but when she spewed it up, like a cauldron over raging fire, all her churning depths would seethe and heave, exploding spray showering down to splatter the peaks of both crags or cliffs at once. But when she swallowed the sea surge down her gaping maw, the whole abyss lay bare and the rocks around her roared, terrible, deafening, bedrock showed through deep, boiling black with sand, and ash and terror gripped the men. So he's describing what it looks like when Charbidus sucks up the ocean, right? So she sucks it all up, and then she spits it out in this crazy whirlpool. But now, fearing death, all eyes fixed on Charbidus, now Scylla snatched six men from our hollow ship the toughest, strongest hands I had, and glancing backward over the decks, searching for my crew, I could see their hands and feet already hoisted, flailing higher, high, higher over my head. Look, 
wailing down at me, comrades riven in agony, shrieking out my name for one last time. Odyssea! Just as an angler poised on a jutting rock flings his treacherous bait in the offshore swell, whips his long rod, hook sheathed in an ox horn lure, and whips up little fish he flips on the beach back, on the beach break, writhing, gasping out of their lives. So now they writhed, gasping as Scylla swung them up her cliff, and there, at her cavern's mouth, she bolted them down raw, screaming out, flinging their arms towards me, lost in that mortal struggle. Of all the pitiful things I've had to witness, suffering and searching out the pathways of the sea, this wrenched my heart the most. But now, at last, putting the rocks, Scylla and Dread Charbidus far astern, we quickly reached the good green island of the sun, where Helios, Lord Hyperion, keeps his fine cattle, broad in the brow and flocks of purebred sheep. Okay. If you are remembering anything from book 11 and the beginning of this book, it's that they were given a very specific instruction about Helios's cattle. I hope you remember what that is, because I'm about to read it. Still aboard my black ship in the open sea, I could hear the lowering, the low, the lowing cattle driven home, the bleeding sheep. And I was struck once more by the words of the blind Thebian prophet Tiresias and Aeon Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun this island of the sun, the joy of man. So I warned my shipmates gravely, sick at heart. Listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. Let me tell you the dire prophecies of Tiresias and Aeon Circe too. Time and again, they told me to shun this island of the sun, the joy of man. Here they warned the worst disaster awaits us. Row straight past these shores race our black ship on. So Odysseus is like following the instructions. Nice job, man. So I said, and the warnings broke their hearts. But Eurylochus waded in at once with mutiny on his mind. You're a hard man, Odysseus. Your fighting spirit stronger than ours. Your stamina never fails. You must be made out of iron, head to foot. Look, your crew is half dead with labor, starved for sleep. And you forbid us to set foot on land, this island here, washed by waves where we might actually catch a decent meal again. Drained as we are, night falling fast, you would have us desert this haven and blunder off into mist-bound seas? Out of the night come winds that shatter vessels. How can a man escape his headlong death? If suddenly, out of nowhere, a cyclone hits, bred by the south or the stormy west wind. They're the gales that tear a ship to splinters. The gods are masters, willing or not, it seems. No. Let's give way to the dark night. Set our supper here, sit tight by the swift ship, and then day at daybreak, board and launch her, make for the open sea. Pause. What is Eurylochus saying? Okay, so that's a clarifying, and I think a probing question, why is Eurylochus saying this? Why? Why? Oh, I'll keep reading. So Eurylochus urged, and our shipmates cheered, hurrah! Then I knew some power was brewing trouble for us, so I let fly with an anxious plea. Me putting on the beard is a great time for you to annotate, just saying, without even having to pause the video. Eurylochus, I'm one against all. 
the upper hand is yours. But swear me a binding oath. I'll hear that if we come on or come upon a herd of cattle or fine flock of sheep, no man among us, blind in his reckless ways, will slaughter an ox or ram. Just eat in peace, content with the food that a mortal Cersei gave us. What does Odysseus make them promise? Why? They quickly swore the oath that I required. And once they had vowed they'd never harm the herds, they moored our sturdy ship in the deep, narrow harbor, close to a fresh spring, and all hands disembarked and adeptly, or like very quickly and well, set about the evening meal. Once they'd put aside desire for food and drink, they recalled our dear companions, wept for the men that Scylla plucked from the hollow ship and ate alive, and a welcome sleep came on them in their tears. As they cried themselves to sleep. Aww. At the night's, oh, but then at the night's third watch, the stars just wheeling down, Zeus, who marshals the storm clouds, loosed a ripping wind, a howling, demonic gale, shrouding over in thunderheads, the earth and sea at once, and night swept down from the sky. When young Dawn, with her rose red fingers, shone once more, we hauled our craft ashore, securing her in a vaulted cave where nymphs have lovely dancing rings and hold their sessions. There, I called a muster, warning my shipmates yet again. Friends, we've food and, and drink aplenty aboard the ship. Keep your hands off those herds or we will pay the price. The cattle and the sheep flocks belong to an awesome master, Helios, god of the sun, who sees all and hears all things. So I warned, and my headstrong men complied, but for one whole month, the south wind blew nonstop. No other wind came up, none but the south, southeast. As long as our ruddy as long as our food and ruddy wine held out, the crew, eager to save their lives, kept their hands off the herds. But then, when supplies aboard had all run dry, when the men turned to hunting, forced to range for quarry with twisted hooks, so they had to fish, for fish, birds, anything they could lay their hands on, hunger racked their bellies. I struck inland, up to the island, there to pray to the gods, if only one might show me some way home. Crossing into the heartland, clear of the crew, I rinsed my hands in a sheltered spot, a windbreak. But as soon as I'd prayed to all the gods who rule Olympus, down on my eyes they poured a sweet sound sleep, as Eurylochus opened up his fatal plan to friends. Uh-oh. Listen to me, my comrades. Brothers in hardship, all ways of dying are hateful to us pure mortals. It's true. But to die of hunger, starve to death, that's the worst of all. So up with you now. Let's drive off the pick of Helios's sleek herds. Slaughter them to the gods who rule the skies up there. And look, if we ever make it home to Ithaca, native ground, we will definitely erect at once a glorious temple to the sun god. Line the walls with, you know, hordes of dazzling gifts. But if the sun, inflamed for his longhorn cattle, means to wreck our ship and the other gods pitch in, I would rather die at sea with one deep gulp of death than die by inches on this desolate land here. Pause. This is like a very good place to annotate. What is Eurylochus saying? Is he saying they're not going to die? No, he's not. So what is he saying? You tell me. So he urged, and the shipmates cheered again. Huzzah! At once, they drove off the sun god's finest cattle. Close at hand, not far from the blue-proud ship they 
grays. Those splendid beasts with their broad brows and curving horns surrounding them in a ring. They lifted prayers to the gods, plucking fresh green leaves from a tall oak for the right, since water strewing barley was long gone in the ship. Once they'd prayed, slaughtered and skinned the cattle, they cut the thigh bones out, they wrapped them round in fat, a double fold sliced clean and topped with strips of flesh. And since they had no wine to anoint the glowing victims, they made libations with water, broiling all the innards. And once they'd burned the bones and tasted the organs, hacked the rest into pieces, piercing them with splits. That moment, soothing slumber fell from my eyes, and down I went to our ship at the water's edge. But on my way, nearing the long-beaked craft, the smoky savor of roast came floating up around me. I groaned in anguish, crying out to the deathless gods, Father Zeus! Oh, sorry. Father Zeus, the rest of you blissful gods who never die, you with your fatal sleep, you lulled me into this disaster. Left on their own, look what a monstrous thing my crew concocted. Quick as a flash with her flaring robes, Lamperty sped the news to the sun on high that we had killed his herds, and Helios burst out in rage to all the immortals. Now I'm Helios. Father Zeus, the rest of you blissful gods who never die, punish them all, that crew of Laertes' son Odysseus. What an outrage. They killed my cattle, the great joy of my heart, day in, day out, when I climbed the starry skies and when I wheeled back down from the heights to touch, to touch the earth once more. Unless they pay me back in blood for the butchery of my herds, down I go to the house of death and blaze among the dead. But Zeus, who marshals the Thunderheads, insisted. I'm Zeus now. Son, you keep shining among the deathless gods and mortal men across the good green earth. As for the guilty ones, well, soon enough. On the wine dark sea, I'll hit their racing ships with a white hot bolt. I'll tear it into splinters. Or, so I heard, from the lovely nymph Calypso, who heard it herself. She said, from Hermes, god of guides. Okay, stop there for a second. We have a lot of dialogue. We hear from Helios, and we hear from Zeus. But do we directly hear from them? How do we know? How does Odysseus know that they've said these things? If you're not sure, pause, go back, reread, and tell me. You can just, you know, not tell me. You can say it out loud to the video if you want. You don't actually have to, you know, tell me because I can't hear you. I'm at home. As soon as I reached our ship at the water's edge, I took the men to task, upbraiding or like yelling at each in turn. But how to set things right? We couldn't find a way. The cattle were dead already, and the gods soon showed us all some fateful signs. The hides began to crawl. The meat, both raw and roasted, bellowed out in the spits, and we heard a noise like the moan of lowing oxen. Ew. Okay, so the dead meat like came to life. Ew. Ew. Yet six more days, my eager companions feasted on the cattle of the sun, the pick of the herds they'd driven off. But then, when Crony and Zeus brought on the seventh day, the wind and ceaseless raging dropped at last, and stepping the mast at once, hoisting the white sail, we boarded the ship and launched her, made for open sea. But once we'd left that island in our wake, no lands in sight, nothing but sea and sky, then Zeus, the son of Kronos, mounted a thunderhead above our hollow ship, and the deep went black beneath it. 
nor did the craft scud on much longer. All of a sudden, killer squalls or waves attacked us, screaming out of the west, a murderous blast she uh, shearing the two forestays off so the mast toppled backwards so like their ship has fallen apart it's running tackle spilling into a bilge i actually don't know what a bilge is if you want to look it up and send me an email let me know the mast itself went crashing into the stern it struck the helmsman head and crushed his skull to a pulp and down from his deck the men flipped like a diver his heart the man flipped like a diver. His hearty life spirit left his bones behind. Then, then in the same breath, Zeus hit the craft with a lightning bolt and thunder. Round she spun, reeling under the impact, filled with reeking brimstone, shipmates pitching or falling out of her, bobbing round like the sea hops, swept along by the white caps past the trim black hull. And the god cut their journey home forever. But I went lurching along our battled hulk till the sea surge ripped the plantings from the keel and the waves swirled it away, stripped bare and snapped the mast from the decks. But a backstay made of bull's hide still held fast. And with this, I lashed or tied the mast and keel together, made them one riding my makeshift raft as the wretched gale winds bore me on and on. At last the west wind quit its wild rage, but the south came on at once to hound me even more, making me double back my route towards cruel Charbidus. All night long I was rushed back, and then at the break of day I reached the crag of Scylla and the dire Charbidus's vortex, right when the dreadful whirlpool gulped the salt sea down. But heaving myself aloft at the fig tree's height like a bat, I clung to its trunk for dear life. Not a chance for a good firm foothold there, no clambering up it either. The roots were too far to reach, the boughs were too high overhead, huge swaying branches that overshadowed Charbidus. So we know how Odysseus escaped. If you don't know, go back and reread from lines 452 till about 460. Now we have Odysseus in like a rather compromising position. So if you're not, if you can't like see the way that he's positioned, he describes it very well. So go back and then you would want to read from lines 460 back to about 470. But I held on dead set, waiting for her to vomit my mast and keel back up, waiting for her to like spit back up his little raft. Oh, how I ached for both. And back they came, late, but at last, at just the hour, a judge at court who settled on countless suits of brash young claimants, rises, the day's work done, and turns home for supper. So he's describing Scylla as like she like went home for supper. That's when the timbers reared back up from Charbidus. I let go. I plunged with my hands and fleet flailing, crashing into the waves besides those great beams and scrambling aboard them fast. I rode hard with my hands right through the straits. And the father of men and gods did not let Scylla see me. Else I would have died on the spot. No escape from death. I drifted along nine days. On the tenth, at night, the gods cast me up on Ogigia, Calypso's island, home of the dangerous nymph with glossy braids who speaks with a human voice. Sounds repetitive, right? It's Calypso this time. And she took me in. She loved me. Why cover the same ground again? Just yesterday, here at Hall, I told you all the rest, you and your gracious wife. It goes against my grain to repeat a tale once told, and told so clearly. What does Odysseus not want to say, specifically about Calypso? Hmm, 
Okay, that's it for me. So that is the end of book 12. Your next assignment is to answer the clarifying questions and do the quote analysis for book 12. Um, and then you're going to want to read just the summaries of books 13, 14, and 15. And I will see you again near the end of the week for book 16. Um, I love you guys. Please feel free to reach out and let me know if you have any questions. I know that I've been like sort of missing some emails because there's been a lot of them, but definitely just like send me some emails and if I don't reply maybe in like a day then send me another one no problem at all right um bye